Basura, welcome to Universal TV. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Right. Um, if I may start with you um, on this question regarding the, um, what is the UN mission's priority in Somalia at the moment? There are three broad priorities. Uh, one is the state formation process, uh, the most salient feature of which this year is the uh, electoral process. Uh, the second is security, how to improve security for all Somalis, uh, both uh, through AMISOM and by strengthening the Somali National Security Forces. And the third is socioeconomic development, uh, in particular seeing if we can protect Somalis from recurrent cycles of humanitarian crisis. Uh, right, so um, if that is the case, what, is, what has been achieved so far? By the UN in Somalia? Well, the UN has been in Somalia a very long time, many, many decades through thick and thin. Uh, I guess the, most, uh, the thing that the UN has contributed to most obviously in recent years has been the state formation process. Somalis decided, uh, as you know, some time ago to uh, go down the federal route. So we've been heavily involved in helping the federal government and interim regional administrations, emerging regional governments, to build the capacity to manage their own affairs. And that's been a bumpy process. The last uh, uh, regional state, uh, Hiran and Middle Shabele, will be formed at some point uh, this year. Uh, and uh, that process obviously has involved a lot of politics. Um, one of the things that we have tried to do is make sure that conflict, conflict is inevitable, it doesn't have to be violent though, is that, that uh, those conflicts uh, turn into politics rather than to violence. So I guess that's one major achievement and uh, of course doing the federal constitution, strengthening the capacity of parliament, uh, supporting Somali politicians, elders and others to have discussions about what kind of state Somalia wants, what should the relationship between the federal government be and the regional government, what kind of judicial system do we want, what kind of policing system, what kind of army do we want, what kind of, you know, what is the basis upon which revenues should be uh, shared or, and the uh, resources managed. So every step of the way uh, we've been involved in, in, in supporting these kind of uh, discussions. Uh, on the security side, um, the UN mission is providing non-lethal support both to AMISOM and to the Somali National Security Forces. That's things like water, food, communications equipment, fuel, and so on. A major logistics operation, and that's been going on for several years. And then, of course, we're also responding to the drought, uh, which has been very bad earlier this year, particularly in Puntland, Somaliland. Right. Um, what do you consider to be a major obstacle or challenges? I think probably the biggest uh, overall challenge, uh, I've put, uh, there are a couple actually. Uh, first is the uh, absence of institutions in Somalia. I mean, institutions have been largely destroyed during so many years of civil war. And inevitably, people have taken, uh, you know, their, they, they find their security in their friends, their family, their clans, and so on. And whether we can build institutions that can deliver basic services like security, health, education, uh, you know, uh, and until we get to that point, I think we're, clan politics will always be dominant. I think another major uh, uh, concern is the potency of Al-Shabaab, which has responded to Amazon's success, really, with support from Somali security forces in getting them out of urban areas over the last five years. They've adapted, and they are now able to swarm and attack military bases, and they're also mounting asymmetric attacks against civilians, and that's, that's, that's very worrisome. Uh, I guess a longer-term issue is Somalia's ability to pay its own way. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, we're in a situation in which the government, federal government, largely through the port, is raising 
I mean, the money's going up, but perhaps $250 million a year to pay for everything. But Somalia costs a lot more than $250 million a year. We're talking about billions a year for uh, the civil service, for the security forces. And if Somalia is ever going to stand on its own two feet, we've got to get to a situation in which the state can raise the revenues uh, that will allow uh, you know, the country to manage its own affairs. And we're a long way away from that. You know, a lot of the money coming in is either from donors or from the diaspora. And the diaspora is very important. The exact figures are unclear, but well above $1.3 billion a year are coming in from all over the world. And that's making a huge difference to many Somalis' ability to survive. Right. Um, Amazon, Amazon's uh, ex exit ex a strategic uh, f of reforming all inclusive Somali National Army not feasible yet. Why is that? Um, forming a, a national army. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna take a while for a national army to be formed. Um, for the reasons I was mentioning before, I think there are quite high levels of distrust among political leaders, power brokers inside Somalia, and many of the security forces are still associated either with particular regions or particular clans or particular, um, you know, leaders. And getting to a point where Somalis trust a national army will take a little bit of time. And in many countries, it's taken decades, even some cases, centuries. And so we're trying to do something in Somalia that in other countries has taken a very long time. Um, but uh, I think the issue is going to be to agree on exactly what kind of model uh, for an army is acceptable to all Somalis. It's got to be a model that the neighbors can live with as well and that the international community can support. And that means looking at issues like, you know, how do you recruit the soldiers? How do you make sure that they're paid on time? How do you train the officers? Uh, and how do you make sure that the population trusts them? And I would make a distinction here, by the way, between the army and the police. Uh, the Somalia is going down a federal route, and policing is actually uh, lends itself to a federal approach more obviously than the army. Um, many countries have um, regional police forces, you know, that are ultimately accountable to local people. And I don't think we should jumble up police and army. And I'm uh, hoping that you know uh, the national policing model will be approved in the next couple of weeks. The National Leadership Forum is meeting in Beidoa in about 10 days. And on their agenda is to approve that model. And if that's the case, uh, that's very exciting. There will be a national model of policing with clear responsibilities at the regional level, at the central level. And that will allow us to, to move forward. Right. Uh, we have uh, 22,000 African soldiers uh, on the ground in Somalia, and yet Amazon failed to keep Mogadishu alone safe, let alone outside. Earlier you talked about chasing al-Shabaab and uh, being uh, uh, victorious and what have you, but the attacks on al-Shabaab is reduced significantly, and al-Shabaab are able to commit atrocities, as you remember. Two weeks ago, uh, um, a hotel ambassador uh, that attack. So did Amazon fail to keep Mogadishu safe, let alone the rest of the country? Uh, well, as I say, uh, if you look back over the last five or six years, uh, Amazon has made a very significant contribution to security. But you're right, uh, Al Shabaab is still able to penetrate uh, urban areas. It controls many uh, rural areas, especially in the south, southwest. And in some parts of the country, it's able to move around at certain times of, of day or night. Now, you know, an ability to mount uh, asymmetric attacks, um, you know, unfortunately isn't limited to Al-Shabaab. Look at other parts of the world. You know, people can mount asymmetric attacks against civilian targets. We've just seen a terrible one in uh, the United States. So, you know, uh, protecting a civilian population from um, uh, extremists who are determined to use violence to make uh, their point uh, is something that's going to take a very, very long time and ultimately depends upon the population itself 
being intolerant of extremist uh, behavior. Uh, and unfortunately, we're not there yet. Uh, Al-Shabaab is, is, is quite mobile. Uh, it uh, clearly has people who are prepared to support it. Uh, and what we need to do is uh, do everything possible to dismantle their capability, interrupt uh, their ability to move around and push them back. But it's going to be quite a long time before Somalia is completely you know, safe from attacks by determined extremist groups who continue to have money and who continue to have individuals who are prepared to uh, commit you know, suicide in order to advance their ideological uh, objectives. Uh, my question to you was, did Amazon let Somali people down? Did they fail to keep Mogadishu safe? Simple question, yes or no? Uh, have they let them down? No, I don't think so. No, I think uh, you probably were in Mogadishu 10 years ago. If you compare Mogadishu 10 years ago with Mogadishu today, it is a lot safer. Uh, not all parts of the city and not at all times of, of the day, but it is much, much safer than it was. Does that mean that Amazon is stopping uh, all uh, ability of al-Shabaab to uh, cause uh, insecurity and mount attacks? No, it doesn't. Uh, and ultimately, it's got to be, as I said, Somalis, not Amazon. I mean, Amazon, as you said, come from five uh, troop-contributing countries, Uganda, Burundi, Kenya, uh, Djibouti, and Ethiopia. You know, in the long run, it's got to be Somalis who provide Somali security, right. not foreign troops. Right, right. So the issue is, how do we get to a point where, you know, Amazon is working with Somali national security forces to prevent this kind of thing from happening. It's not exclusively a foreign military responsibility. Right. I, I understand that, but the point here is the Somali national troops will never be built as long as the foreign troops are on the soil uh, in, in, Somal in Somalia. They pay uh, millions of dollars when the Somali soldiers are not being paid properly, not being trained, not equipped to fight al-Shabaab. How are you expect the Somali soldiers to take responsibility. You, um, African soldiers are there to keep Somalia safe, and that is not happening. And Somali soldiers are not being given the opportunity to deliver what you just said. Well, uh, you know, as I said before, for Somalia's security forces to be uh, capable, there's got to be real trust by the population, as well as by political leaders in Somalia, uh, about the security forces, about having an army that is capable, uh, about having a police force uh, that is capable, that everyone trusts. And we're moving in that direction, but we haven't got there. P Somalis themselves don't necessarily trust their own security forces unless they happen to come from their own clan or their own area. And we've got to get to a point where we have uh, Somali security forces that everybody trusts, that are capable, uh, and we're not there yet. And this is part of Somalia's political journey, is rebuilding confidence uh, in institutions. Now, uh, you know, the ability of foreign troops to provide security in Somalia, as I said, is limited. You know, they can do so much, maybe they could do more. But ultimately, it's got to be about Somalis having confidence in their own ability to manage their own security, as with anywhere in the world. I mean, you know, people do not want their security ultimately resting in the hands of foreigners. Right. They want their own uh, people to do it. Right. We'll come to that. Said the Somalis do not trust us, their own uh, security forces. Somali soldiers are capable of defeating al-Shabaab. A prime example of that is what happened in Mountain Galgala in Pontchland. With little training, they managed to defeat that. With 22,000 African soldiers, and Somali soldiers in Mogadishu could not provide peace and security in that city. Clearly, it's a failure. Well, I mean, you're, uh, you know, I mean, I don't work for Amazon. Okay, I work for the United Nations. My job is to is to try and uh, advance the political process and help Somalis manage their own affairs. So my focus is on strengthening Somalis' own ability to build their institutions, including in security, which is why I keep saying the issue is how do we strengthen Somali's own security capacity? How do we, how do we build an army? How do we build a police force? How do we, 
how do we do things uh, in a way that allows Somali to take back control of their own destiny, you know, including to pay for security forces? Um, so, okay, yeah. Um, we all know um, Amazon um, comes to Somalia under the UN mandate uh, led by the African forces. Under what mandate the Ethiopian troops are deployed in Somalia? Uh, Ethiopian troops in Amazon are deployed under a UN mandate. Um, as we know, when the African soldiers were deployed in Somalia, Ethiopia was not one of them. They joined later on. So I'm asking, under what mandate do they join in? I, I would have thought that they're there because the federal government of Somalia uh, is, uh, has agreed to their presence inside Somalia. What about your office? But I'm not a sovereign state. I work for the United Nations. If the government of Somalia says to the government of Ethiopia, you know, your troops are welcome here, then that's a decision by the Somali government. It's not a, it's not a UN decision. Right. Um, in that case, do you know uh, under what command do they operate the Ethiopian troops? Uh, I mean, they have their own military command. They have their own, you know, chief of defense forces uh, and so on. Do you have any idea how many of them are on the ground? I don't have the f numbers at my fingertips, no. Um, if we move on, um, um, s s actually, let's stay on security a bit more. Um, we know Amazon is given two, month, two months extension. Is there any change of plan for Amazon to peacekeeping mission in Somalia? Um, there are a number of uh, things going on uh, inside the African Union and among Amazon troop contributing countries. Uh, there was a meeting in Djibouti a couple of months ago in which uh, they recognized that they have to strengthen their command and control, uh, that they need to be more agile in response to the changing nature of the Al-Shabaab threat. Uh, they're looking for better ways to share intelligence, more air assets, um, you know, uh, more mobility uh, that would allow them to respond. And there is a meeting coming up in Kampala at which all these issues are going to be discussed. There's also issues about funding for Amazon. Uh, and the African Union is now trying to uh, fill a drop in the level of funding for Amazon troops. Uh, so there's a number of things going on uh, you know, to try and strengthen the capability of Amazon to respond to this uh, changed tactics. Uh, by Al Shabaab. Right. Um, Egypt chair by Ethiopia is playing a, a role in state building in Somalia and peace building and in inverted commerce. Egypt facilitation office in is in Ardu is heavily based is heavily involved in Somali eternal affairs. In the past, we know the UN uh, as a neutral partner led peace process, why the UN, in particular your office, surrender this responsibility to Egat Ethiopia? I wasn't aware of surrendering anything to anyone. Uh, you know, the UN will respond to requests to facilitate peace processes, and we get those kind of re requests all the time, whether from the federal government, from the re regional governments and administrations, whether from local populations, whether from tribal chiefs. If EGAD is asked to facilitate a particular process, then, you know, so be it. Um, they have but a very... That's your responsibility. Of your office of responsibility. I don't no think... Well, I mean, I think trying to reduce violence between warring parties isn't the exclusive domain of the United Nations. You do it at the right level with the right actors according to the particular circumstances. And if the local actors have requested EGAD to do it for whatever reason... Uh, and if they are willing to do it and they have the credibility with the warring factions to do it, then that, that's fine. I, you know, I don't, uh, you know, you, 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 well, you ask the people who have asked them to come in. I mean, I think if they would, if. I'm asking you because you're shifting the responsibility over to them, so I'm asking. Uh, no, you're using these words like surrender. I, no, the UN hasn't surrendered anything to anyone, and I'm not shifting responsibility to anybody else. Right. I mean, if you are asked to, um, uh, you know, uh, mediate a dispute between your neighbours, you personally, is that the police surrendering to you to do it? 
or is it you responding to people wanting you to do something? Is it you shifting responsibility from the police? No, it's not. It's you responding to the particular circumstances in which you're being asked to resolve something. Now, these things sort themselves out. If they don't have credibility and if they don't have acceptability, they won't be able to do it, and we will probably be asked to come in and help. But, th you know, saying surrender and shifting responsibility is a, is a misreading of basic, you know, uh, you know the, the basic circumstance thing. I don't, you know, if they don't have the confidence of those who are involved in this conflict, then they won't get very far. But if they do and they've been advised to come in, I think they should be given a shot. Right, we leave that to the Somali uh, public, um, whether Ethiopia or Igad is, is capable of um, sorting out Somali's problem. And I always thought Somalis are capable of taking their problems and sorting it out by themselves. Absolutely. It's, 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 I think it's, that should be a basic principle. Right. That whenever Somalis can sort out their own problems, they should do it. They should not ask outsiders to do it unless they have to. As I say, you should always respond to people's requests for you to help them, not interfere. Right. Uh, um, okay, okay, good. Um, let's talk about funding in Somalia. Uh, four million, since 2014 and 16 at, the, at this present moment, four billion US dollars went to Somalia. We are told eight um, since the state collapse in Somalia. This is the largest amount of money ever been donated to Somalia. And that amount of money, Somali public do not benefit, and do not see it. The president, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed himself said, and I quote, we can only account for less than 20% of those fundings. Can you explain this great discrepancy? I don't know what four billion, you're, you're saying four billion a year or four billion four in billion total? Since, since 2014 until now. Uh, okay, well you would have to explain to me what four billion we're talking about, but what I can say is that a lot of the money provided for development assistance and humanitarian assistance, if that's what we're that's talking what we're about, about, does not go through national systems. And, uh, uh, you know, we would like it to do so. In other words, put it through uh, the government, put it through the central bank. Uh, but what the countries that are providing this assistance are saying is that until they have greater confidence in uh, the uh, those systems, including accountability, financial transparency, the legal parameters, then it is difficult for them to justify to their taxpayers, because ultimately this is coming from the pockets of of, of you know North American, Western European, other taxpayers. They have to justify to their own taxpayers how the money is spent, and until the national systems are robust, then that level of accountability is often weak uh, or even absent. So the fact that only uh, something like 5 6% of international development assistance is going through national systems, in my view, is, is most unfortunate. And we have to change that. We have to increase that dramatically. I would like to see something like 50% of all international money going through national systems. But that means you've got to have the national systems that are, are, are fully functional. Right, let's move to the elections, which is a very uh, hot topic at the moment. What is your main priority on this particular um, uh, event? Well, first of all, I'd call them an electoral process because, you know, saying elections makes it sound as if it's one person, one vote. Uh, it's not going to be like that at all. I mean, an obvious point to make is they are midway, both politically and temporarily, uh, between 2012 and 2020. 2012, 135 elders chose 275 MPs. 2020, we're talking about millions and millions of Somalis going to the ballot box. Uh, now, that's an experience that Somalis have not had since 1969. You have to be over 67 years old to have that very exciting experience of knowing that your personal view is going to make a difference as to who ends up you know, being in power. So 2016, uh, you know, the Electoral College will be expanded by a hundredfold to about 14,000 um, electors, and it will be a process rather than a once-off event. So I'm hoping it will be pointing towards 2020 while in terms of being a managed process with a group that's looking at the integrity of the process at the moment. You know, we're working with both the federal and the regional authorities to create something called the Federal Indirect Election Implementation Team, as it were, the referee 
uh, in the electoral process. It's a bit like a football tournament. You need linesmen, you need referees, you need a Hawkeye, you know, uh, and you know, it's a measure of how far we have to go that we have to build uh, an institution to be the referees for this process. That didn't happen in 2012. It's going to be needed in 2020 through the National Independent Electoral Commission. So I'm hoping that 2016 will be a, a much, first of all, it'll be a proper process. There'll be much greater level of women's involvement. There'll be uh, voting taking place in five or six locations, not just in <coughs> Mogadishu. So there's going to be aspects to it which look like a much broader election. But don't confuse that with it being universal elections. It's not. It's, it's, it's still going to be very much clan-based, uh, very much about uh, power politics and so on. Right. Uh, we're well aware there won't be a one-man, one-vote election, sadly, um, although we, some other public will promise that, and that dream is being uh, ripped apart. Um, we know there's a lot of uh, problems whenever this election in Somalia vote buy-in and schemes and stuff like that. And that will have a profound impact of the election uh, legitimacy. Why can we not have or been created a commission against the corruption to disqualify abuses of uh, the uh, power? Why not? I mean, you know, there can be, uh, but it's up to the Somalis themselves to put that in place. and and. We're certainly encouraging them to do that through this federal independent uh, indirect election implementation team. I mean, uh, the the point is that you know if you're going to run an election, you have to have Somalis themselves, uh, you know, deciding what the parameters of that electoral process are going to be. Uh, and there's a misconception here that you know somehow. Uh, you know, sometimes I get accused of why is the UN backing a 4.5? I mean, the idea that the international community came up with 4.5 is is ridiculous. We don't have the uh, imagination to come up with a 4.5 system. This is a, a Somali system, a, and, and what we are trying to do is say, you know, what is going to work for you? What will you consider to be free and fair? And what to what degree are you going to be accountable to the broader Somali public? for this, because if you come up with a system that is just looks like a s stitched up deal behind closed doors, uh, it's not going to be seen as legitimate either by the Somali public or by the, Som uh, or, or by the international community. And that's very important, because what we're trying to do is maintain very high levels of international support for Somalia. But if the electoral process is seen as, first of all, not being a proper process, and secondly, not being one in which a major effort has been done to ensure a degree of transparency and fairness, then it won't succeed in, in, in you know, uh, a legitimate transfer of power. Uh, right. Uh, earlier you touched the Hiran and Middle Shabel. Uh, um, we know there's a great dispute, uh, political crisis, uh, in fact, between the Villa Somalia and Hiran and Shabela. Uh, what impact would this have on the election itself? Well, I mean, uh, we're hoping that the uh, elders of Hiran and Middle Shabeli will reach a political agreement uh, in the coming uh, months, uh, which will allow um, the state to be formed uh, by the time the electoral process takes place. Will that uh, you know, I mean, in these situations, it's really important for reconciliation processes to be done properly, because if you rush them, and you come up with an agreement that leaves a lot of people out, you may be you know, coming up with a short-term solution, but you're laying the basis for long-term problems. So it's really important that that process is done properly. Um, you know, there, is, uh, there are the contours of uh, an agreement, but they haven't been fully discussed. I think more discussion is required in, in, in both in Bella Twain to make sure that the, the groups up there are on the same page uh, in, in Johar as well, uh, but also in, in Bulaberto, which could end up being a good uh, compromise uh, for everyone. Uh, but it takes time. And one thing that I'm learning in the five months that I've been in, 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 in Somalia is that everybody's a politician and everybody loves talking. Uh, and uh, it, it's uh, very important to balance 
the need to make sure that all those who have strong views and who can disrupt an agreement if their views are not taken into account, to provide the time and space for that, at the same time as pointing out that you know if you don't maintain uh, a certain momentum, you could be talking forever and ever and ever, and things are never going to happen. And ultimately, uh, in my view, you know, politicians uh, do have a responsibility to the broader public. I mean, I don't need to tell you that Somalia, alas, is still one of the, you know, the poorest uh, countries on the planet, despite its wealth, despite the entrepreneurship of its uh, citizens, despite the dynamism of its private sector. We have, it's one of the toughest places on the planet Earth to be a woman. You know, the educational levels are so low. Life expectancy is so low. Millions of people are dependent upon the weather for their, uh, f for their livelihoods. We've got to get to a point where we can, you know, pull together, create the institutions that can deliver security and jobs and justice. And if the politicians just endlessly talking among themselves, you know, the prospect of getting to that point will never advance. Um, we know the president Hassan Sheikh Mohammed a um, uh, while back he said that he will definitely be standing on this election. Um, there's also unconfirmed reports which Universal TV cannot verify at this stage that the Prime Minister himself is also a candidate. Um, let's say for the sake of the argument they both are. How come they still in charge of the election affairs? Isn't that conflict of interest? There is definitely a potential conflict of interest. And, you know, again, uh, I, I go back to the point I made before that, you know, in many countries, in most countries, you have institutions that will, you know, manage these conflicts of interest. And if you are a serving politician standing for election, whether in the UK or elsewhere, what you end up having to do is obey by the rules and those rules are set by things like electoral commissions and constitutional courts uh, and the police make sure that they are you know put in place and you have observers and monitors now what's both exciting and also very challenging for Somalia is that we're going into an electoral process without having uh, many of the institutions that normally you associate with uh, refereeing an electoral process so you are right, and they're aware of it, that they are both candidates, and yet they have responsibilities as, uh, as you know, prime minister and president in the case of the two you mentioned, but there are many others, uh, you know, and all we can do is appeal to them uh, to behave in the interests of all Somalis and in terms of their own historic legacy uh, and balance that with their ambition uh, to become, uh, you know, the next uh, uh, heads of state or, or whatever it happens to be. In the meantime, the race is on to build real institutional capacity. Right. Uh, there are a lot of legal issues arises from the formation of the upper house. Do you and the rest of the international community support the violation of the Somali constitution? No. You don't? No. Finally, my final question to you is, uh, what effort is being made to the young Somalis to get involved in the political process, as well as women who uh, were given 30%, but still uh, saying that they were not being um, given all those seats? Well, the good news there is that the National Leadership Forum, which, as you know, uh, consists of the President, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Speaker, and the four heads of regional administrations and governments, has committed itself to involving broader sections of Somali society, including young people, and in particular women, uh, in the electoral process. Uh, the question is, how is this going to be done? Uh, what we have been asked to do as the UN and the broader international community is help them to realize their own memorandum to themselves about doing this. And specifically, I think, in the case of the women in the electoral process, it's about persuading uh, uh, clan elders uh, that it is in their interests uh, to have uh, women uh, selected uh, both part of the electoral colleges, but also selected as MPs. Now, that's a tough argument to win. 
there are a number of arguments that can be made, but it's not going to be an easy, uh, easy uh, w uh, one to win. The good news is that over 14% of the current seats, which were selected rather than elected, uh, are represented uh, by uh, women. And the question is whether we can use that as an absolute minimum baseline and go beyond that. But uh, it's about partly women themselves making the case uh, with their own uh, clans, with their own elders, with their own constituencies, that their involvement is better for Somalia, it's better for politics, it's better for constitutional approaches, uh, that they can bring uh, to politics uh, issues which otherwise get lost, uh, including uh, you know things like uh, uh, human rights, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, growth, not just women's issues. Women have very strong views. I mean, I, I'm always impressed when I travel around the country and when I meet uh, Somali women activists, they're very articulate. Uh, so I think their involvement will, 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 will improve politics. As for young people, uh, unfortunately, there haven't been extensive opinion polls or focus groups, but the evidence suggests that young people, as with young people everywhere in the world, uh, are fed up with divisive politics. They want to see positive changes that will allow them to get a better education, better job opportunities, better you know, connectivity. And I think involving them in politics is going to be very important. But again, it's tough. You know, not everyone has access to social media. Uh, a lot of politics is confined either to Mogadishu or to the regional capitals. And figuring out how to engage uh, young people uh, in politics and in decisions about uh, you know, how resources are spent and how their lives will be affected is not going to be easy. But it's something that we, are, you know, as the UN, uh, are, are very active in supporting. Are you optimistic that Somalia will have election there, or electoral, as you put it, and we'll move forward from here? Uh, I, I am basically optimistic. I mean, uh, you know, as I say, when I meet young people and women and politicians and everyone, I'm, I'm really impressed uh, by the sense that Somalia is changing, uh, that it's moving forward. Uh, having said that, I mean, I think people are very aware of the risks uh, to this process we go back to you know al-shabab uh, and and the violence uh, that they're creating i think security is the biggest uh, threat to political progress and in fact one of the reasons why we've got to maintain political momentum and why this electoral process is so important is that uh, you know without it maintaining security uh, is going to be much much more difficult uh, don't forget that when the UN mandated the African Union to, um, you know, uh, uh, send a, a force into Somalia, one of the main reasons was to create the space for Somalis to sort out uh, their own uh, political differences. And if, you know, that space is created and it's not used to move things forward, then a lot of people who are investing in security, whether through the African Union or through the S Somali security forces, will say, well, you know, why are we doing all this? If we can't maintain political momentum, uh, you know, how can we continue to justify uh, the use of, of lots of money and people's lives uh, for, for uh, 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 a process that isn't going anywhere? Ambassador Michael, thank you very much for being us on Universal TV.